So welcome today. We're going to be talking about Kubernetes as a hypervisor. Automating the lifecycle of virtual machines in Kubernetes using Ansible and Kubevirt. So my name is Andrew Block. I'm a distinguished architect at Red Hat and our services organization. I work with customers globally on basically anything in tech these days. You name it, I probably have touched it at some point in my career. Everything from the latest and greatest AI and cool stuff that we see every day getting more and more popular to, yes, I did start my career, my professional career, learning COBOL and mainframe. So I've seen literally everything. Um, and I want to introduce Harsha, my co-presenter. Hi, I'm Harsha. I work as senior software engineer with Red Hat. I've been with Red Hat for seven years now. I work primarily with the DevOps EAP team. Uh, Harsha and I both work on the same team because we uh, productize uh, Ansible collections for Red Hat's middleware portfolio. So if you are, in, are using Red Hat's middleware portfolio and especially one of them using Ansible, the two of them are just wonderful peanut butter and jelly put together. So applications and systems are running in more places than ever before. Everywhere from the data center to the public cloud to the edge. And being able to meet demand where it's needed is incredibly important. Now, when you're operating in these different environments, they can be running on a number of different profiles. Everything from bare metal infrastructure, where your compute is running directly on the infrastructure. Virtualized, which is basically using emulation on a existing system, or you can even use devices. A lot of systems right now are running on our phones and other type of IoT devices. I know, especially as you're going to the supermarket, you probably have picked up a number of products and now you're, there's devices running on those products as well, RFID chips, et cetera. However, virtual machines, we can pretty much all agree upon right now that virtual machines continue to reign supreme. Why are they still so popular? And number one, if we look at just virtual machines in general, why they're so popular is if we look at compared to like bare metal, they have resource optimization, resource utilization optimizations. They are able to scale much better than traditional, just straight on bare metal. For all the bean counters in the room, they do help with reducing costs. You can, they're pretty cheap to spin up and spin down. You can reuse one physical or several physical infrastructures, as well as compatibility. You can run more and more applications on virtual infrastructure versus some of the more modern systems. And we'll talk through some of them as we go along today. And not only do, do what we think and what we know about virtual machines is true, the numbers back them up. The virtual machine market continues to grow, and over the next 10 years will continue to grow even more. So they're not going anywhere. They're not like they're gonna see a, a downward trend. They're gonna continue getting more and more popular and more and more used. Other technologies are still gonna be used. You know, we look at you know, containers, you look more edge devices, yes, but still VMs and virtual environments will continue to reign supreme. So underneath any virtual environment is the hypervisor. Now, the hypervisor itself, for those of you who don't know, is basically the software layer that is responsible for managing virtual machines. How many of you use VMs in some form or another? Raise your hand. What do you use? I, it's early, I'm going to get you all up. Okay, what do you guys use? Proxmox, Libvirt, KVM, VirtualBox. If, you didn't, if I didn't hear VirtualBox, I would start to wonder how many of you use. Are, are any vSphere administrators here? Anybody use vSphere? I gotta say it, sure you might. And then we also have your cloud providers. I mean, your cloud provider is a hypervisor. How many of you spin up EC2 instances or a Azure or Google? It's all virtual. It's all using a hypervisor under the covers. The cloud, as you'll see here in one of the, in one of the bullet points, abstracts it with an API layer. You're not talking directly to the hypervisor. You're probably talking to a proxy, which is then talking to it. But still, there's some APIs involved that you can then automate and integrate with. And that's one of the benefits about virtual, virtual systems is that most modern virtual hypervisors do provide an API. And that provides a lot of opportunities for automation and management. Because if I'm going and clicking a button, 
How many of it's, you, how many of you, you know, go in, learn something new, click buttons, right? Whether it be GitHub, whether it be you know, VirtualBox, et cetera. But then, after a while, I just want a VM. I don't want to keep clicking buttons. You want to automate it. Maybe you'll put some bash scripts together. Use an automation tool like Ansible. An automation tool like Ansible. Now, no matter where, virtual machines will run everywhere. They're running in different data centers across the world. You know, you go into EC2, you have your pick of the litter. I can go ahead and deploy it in US East 1 over in Virginia. I can do it over in uh, APAC, whatever the one in Singapore is, number one, AP1, which is over in Singapore. I can go wherever I want. They can run wherever you want. But how on earth do you manage all that? You're going to be having machines running wherever. How can they, you ensure that they run not only in the same configuration, are managed properly, and managed effectively? And that's where you need an automation tool. And that's where Ansible Automation comes to the rescue. Now, if you've not heard of Ansible Automation, it is three pillars, simple, powerful, and agentless. That's one of the big, biggest benefits of Ansible is that it is agentless. Many, many automation tools have an agent-based approach where you have to install a piece of software on the target system. Ansible uses the opposite message, where it will go ahead and communicate to the remote system without requiring the need for an agent. It use, makes use of a human-readable automation, which allows you to get up to speed quickly. You don't have to spend time you know, digging through minute code. You can write simple YAML. YAML is very readable compared to some other programming languages and other syntaxes. It's powerful. It can do everything from provisioning infrastructure, configuring virtual and physical machines, as well as managing app deployments and app configurations and system configurations. And to communicate to the target systems, it uses primarily SSH or WinRM if you're using Windows. There are other tools that you can also leverage if you're looking at managing networking configuration. You can, the switches here can also be managed via, network, via Ansible networking. So you can do anything you want with Ansible automation. Now, as I mentioned when I said Ansible can do a lot of things, it can do a lot of things. It can talk to cloud, it can talk to ITSM systems, it can talk to your networking layer, it can talk to your infrastructure layer, and personally, this is kind of an area that I've actually been working in a lot recently, is security. It can enforce security in ways that your auditing teams, your security teams, they become your new best friends because you're doing the actual good deeds for them versus how many of you, show of hands, have gotten the nasty gram from security compliance auditing at some point in your career? You don't have to tell me what, please don't tell me which, what it was because I, mean, I don't want to know. But what Ansible can do is it can provide everything that your teams need to comply with whatever regulatory actions that your company needs to comply with or what your department standards are. If I say I need to always have the message of the day say, hello, this is a server that is managed by OKI team, whatever that means, you can comply with that. That's one of the benefits of Ansible automation. So we talked a lot about virtual machines. And we'll talk about the elephant in the room. Kubernetes, containers, right? It's the thing, right? Anything you talk about these days is all Kubernetes and all containers. I'll ask, I'm going to guess the answer is no. How many here have not heard of Kubernetes? Just for baseline. OK, so everyone's heard of Kubernetes. I can, I can, I can basically skim the next slide. You never know when you have a public conference. You never know who, what, what everyone's you know, comfortability in terms of the different technologies. It's a container orchestration platform adopted by enterprises in the community. 85% of enterprises, I spend most of my time in the enterprise, 85% have either using or evaluating Kubernetes in their environment. That's incredible. When you think about Kubernetes being not even 10 years old, that's one of the most impactful technologies that I've worked with um, in my career. Probably Docker and containers, the underlying technology, is probably the one technology I think that has bigger adoption in my career in the last 15 years that I've been in the industry. So, and also, if we talk about security, use of Kubernetes really has triggered that whole DevSecOps movement because you make it easier to be able to not only deploy faster, which allows the DevOps movement, but integrate security into these conversations so that you can now bring your entire organization all together to not only move faster, but move more faster securely. And that's the cool thing about it. So, we talked about the cool things. 85% of, of enterprises are using containers. Why would I not be able to use containers for all my apps, right? Throw everything in a container. It's just going to work. Have 
you seen some of the applications that are running in systems these days? You don't want to even know how they work under the covers. So why can't you deploy everything to Kubernetes? The biggest thing, honestly, is compatibility. Not everything can run well in a container. I work in, with containers daily. I have customers that have that basically run their entire business on containers. A lot of the startups, a lot of like the newer technology, a lot of newer orgs, newer companies, they're so lucky. They don't have legacy debt. They don't have systems that are older than all of us in the room. I know that I, my biggest, my, my, I, I travel a lot. And when I leave an airport, I always go to the checkout stand, you know, as I'm taking out the rental car. And you have the flashiest website, you know, cool, nice, nice and modern, et cetera. I go and check out that car, agents sitting there, you know what they're looking at? The green screen, because they're talking directly to the mainframe still. Next time, you do, next time you go to the car rental facility, check it out. Good chance they're going to be running on the mainframe still. Every bank is still on the mainframe. Any modern enterprise is running on the mainframe. You can't deploy everything on, on containers. Another, 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 benefit, another um, detriment of why we can't get to containers is time and effort. It takes time to, moder to migrate from existing environments to containers. And then organizational priorities. I need to make money today. I don't have time for containers. Just go ahead and make sure we keep making money. So every one of these are reasons why we can't all go right to containers right now. And really, it just comes down to a, moderniza a, a modernization strategy. Because there are different modernization strategies that many organizations are going through. And if you want to look at how we can make use of new technology, work faster, but still avoid a lot of the work when it comes to a migration, that's where rehosting is an option. How can we take what we're currently running and put it in a new way, a new pattern, a new paradigm? So what happens if we could deploy and manage virtual machines in Kubernetes? It's kind of that perfect storm, perfect combination. We can. Through, through, the, through, the, through the benefits of Kubevert, the Kubevert project upstream, and OpenShift virtualization from Red Hat. It provides a virtualization API in runtime that leverages KVM technologies. I know I heard some KVM is, is one of their tools. To, to allow you to run and manage virtual machines in a very Kubernetes specific way. So if you're very familiar with Kubernetes, it's really weird when you're actually managing virtual machines, like a pod almost. So what are some key principles of Kubevert virtualization? Number one, virtual machines, we're not reinventing the wheel here. They just run as pods, normal pods in Kubernetes. They consume resources just like any other pod. You can put constraints on them. You can still give it limit ranges and requests. Nothing changes. You do have a dedicated API because there are differences between a virtual machine and a pod. And VMs have their specific functionality. And that why is we have a dedicated set of APIs, custom resource definitions, similar to any other tool. OpenShift, if you're familiar with OpenShift, has a slew of APIs that are dedicated for OpenShift. Qvert, OpenShift virtualization, same thing. So under the covers, here's how it works. Basically, we're going to translate our virtual, virtual machine concepts into Kubernetes. Basically, every, run, every, run, every VM runs in a launcher pod. That launcher pod will supervise using libvirt and provide the pod integration and then use QEMU emulation to actually provide that emulation layer for the virtual machine. So it basically allows you to bring the virtual world into Kubernetes. In kind of a crazy way, I mean, it, was, it was, blew my mind when the first time I started playing with it. I'm like, I mean, virtual machines in Kubernetes? I mean, I can actually log in just like any other Linux machine? Crazy. So why, does it, why do we still need automation for managing virtual machines in Kubernetes? Because Kubernetes is it's Kubernetes is totally different, right? Not really. Because Kubernetes and virtual machines, it just happens to be another way, another location that you're running a virtual machine. You still have everything that it takes to stand up and manage a virtual machine. Everything from, okay, if I decide to make use of Kubevert and open your virtualization, how do I actually get my VMs that might be running in my existing hypervisor over there? Where are my day one operations? How do I actually establish the VMs? How do I go ahead and then configure it? And then day two. Day two, this is the most important thing I hear. Let's go ahead and let's get everything over to open virtualization, everything over to Kubevert. Everyone kind of forgot that, no, once you actually get these machines running, there's an entire life cycle 
that you have to manage outside of it. And it's independent of Kubernetes. Kubernetes is just managing the life, actually just keeping it running. What about the configuration inside the VM? It's, you still need to manage that. If I have an EC2 instance, okay, it's running an EC2, yay, yippee. But if you don't actually configure it properly and manage it, it's just another box and then becomes a security vulnerability as more and more, more and more security risks come up. Fortunately, we have Ansible automation to come to the rescue. And there's a set of Ansible modules that are in, in plugins that are here dedicated for you to manage um, your entire OpenShift and Kubevert virtual environment in an automated fashion. We have ways to manage not only establishing the VM, but also learning more about the VM. And how many of you are familiar with Ansible? How many of you have heard of an inventory plugin? I can go in, to, I can go in inspect my, e, my EC2 environment and go ahead and pull all the host information. I can do the same thing in OpenShift virtualization in Kubevert. I can go ahead and populate my inventory and then have it be able to then target it just like any other hypervisor. It runs almost in the exact same way. And it's really crazy because that's what we're going to demonstrate today is showing how easy and how simple the concepts are to translate from an existing hypervisor to this new world. Nothing changes, but we're providing the tools that enable you to make and reuse your existing infrastructure and your existing paradigms. We don't want you to reinvent everything. We just want you to reinvent it in a new way. So here's a good example. I want to learn more information about a VM in particular. Let's say I have a VM out there called Test VM, deployed in the Kubernetes namespace default, and I want to learn more about it. I can go ahead and make use of a module from the OpenShift virtualization collection, the Red Hat dot OpenShift dot OpenShift underscore virtualization, and make use of the Kubevert VM info module. So this kind of breaks it up. So basically, if you're familiar with collections, this becomes our namespace. This is the Red Hat namespace. There is an upstream version as well, so you're not tied to Red Hat. Being from Red Hat, please use the Red Hat stuff. Please, please, please. I'm just saying, just saying. And then go ahead and we have at least two modules that we provide, Kubevert uh, VM, which allows you to manage the VM itself, as well as you can learn more about the information from the VM, which then allows you to perform more, automa more automation on it. And then you can go ahead and use all the same Ansible automation that you've used already. I can use the same keywords, I can register facts, as well as then interpret the results and perform automation based on them. Okay, we talked a lot about a lot of, a lot, we talked about a lot of concepts. Are. This is a tech conference, and I don't want to talk about slides the entire time. So I'm going to go ahead and bring up Harsha, who's going to showcase how easy it is to take an existing VM infrastructure that is running inside a traditional hypervisor, OpenStack, for example, and how that can be translated over into OpenShift virtualization and Kubevert using Ansible automation with minimal change on your end. Harsha? Yeah, thanks, Andy. Hi. Uh, so, our. Yeah, our scenario uh, would be like, we'll be using the Ansible automation platform and create uh, virtual machines on the OpenStack environment and then deploy the EAP cluster. And we'll be doing the same thing on uh, OpenShift as well. Uh, both uh, will be done using the Ansible collections. So we ran the, the OpenStack one uh, just before the demo because it takes a bit of time. Uh, so basically, this is how our workflow looks. Uh, we sync the project, so we are using the Ansible automation platform. We sync the a demo, uh, then we create the resources uh, on the OpenStack environment. Uh, then we use uh, the OpenStack inventory plugin, and then we deploy uh, EAP as a cluster using uh, Red Hat certified EAP collection. So I'll just show you what it created. Wi-Fi is okay. Coming up. Create the technology no, gods. It's actually VPN. Oh yeah, you see. Uh, so uh, we have uh, our VMs up, and if you see. Uh, I'll go in bit, bit detailed once we have the open shift stuff deployed as well, but uh, this is where you see our EAP deployed on uh, 
OpenStack environment. Okay. Yeah. So we'll do this. So I'll sh I'll show the same. So this is. So, so this is what uh, we're gonna do on the, the OpenShift as well. I'll click off the uh, the demo and then we'll talk about it. And bake that cake while it's doing its thing. So. Yeah. It takes 10 minutes and we have about 15 minutes. Let's, we're going to get it just in under, under, under the wire. Let's hope. Come on, technology. Yeah. So what we're doing is we're emphasizing how easy it is. We've made little changes on the OpenShift side. We've used a lot of the same tooling. The only, dif the only difference that we've made is we are using the collections for that are targeting OpenShift virtualization instead of OpenStack. We're using many of the same collections that we use for deploying and configuring JBoss EAP, configuring Red Hat Enterprise Linux, all now in Kubernetes. We've done very little change. That's the goal here is that if you're in an organization that has thousands and thousands of VMs and you're looking to be able to then repoint it to a new location, you want to make as little change as possible. You don't want to rewrite everything. So what we've done here is we're showcasing just how simple it is for you to just make use of OpenShift virtualization, make use of the primitives, with little change, but use the same automation that you and you and your organization have developed over the years. I'll just go through a bit on the code in the meantime. Uh, so yes, uh, this is. Sorry. If, if you can make it a little bigger, it'd be really helpful. Yeah. Yeah, this is a uh, uh, this is a playbook which creates the resources uh, in OpenStack. Uh, it use uh, so basically, if you go to the row, uh, you, we use the OpenStack plug, uh, collection, uh, open OpenStack server collection, OpenStack server collection uh, to actually run it. So this basically creates the VMs or the infrastructure, and then uh, the similarly on QWERT. Uh, it uses uh, the Red Hat OpenStick virtualization collection. So we use the openshift.k8 collection to create the namespace, uh, the networking, the root. And then for virtual machines, we use openshift underscore virtualization collection uh, to create the VMs and the networking around it. Uh, once we have that, uh, we also use the Red Hat EAP collection uh, to deploy uh, EAP as a cluster on two VMs. Uh, we use the EAP, Red Hat.EAP install collection to install the EAP, and then we use the system MD uh, role to uh, in set up the system M MD inside it. Then we uh, deploy a demo app on it. So, so, so when it's all done, we're gonna show, we're, when it's all done, we're gonna showcase how you can access it in the same way that any traditional Kubernetes application is. So if you're familiar with OpenShift, we have a service that is sitting over, over the two VMs. We have a route that we've exposed outside the cluster. That's it, we've done nothing else. That's probably the only difference in terms of uh, networking that we've done from OpenShift to OpenStack and vice versa. We just had to create two additional Kubernetes resources. Everything else is just VMs and VMs. And if you happen to be leveraging, let's say, a load balancer service in your cloud provider, say you happen to be running OpenShift in AWS, maybe on Rosa, you can use the cloud provider as a load balancer instead of OpenShift's router. There are many different options that you have out there. But what we're doing is we're just letting you, being the designer, the architect in your Kubernetes environment, make use of the technology that's available to you, and you can make informed decisions. But from the underlying, I have a VM, I have stuff on the VM, we use Ansible and reusing those t tools and primitives for you to be able to not only configure your environment at scale. So good news is, let's say we got OpenShift um, services running. Go over to OpenShift um, Harsha and showcase the, um, the, the virtual machines that were spun up. So in the virtualization tab, you should be able to see those VMs. These are the virtual machines we created, um, and, and uh, under networking, we have created the services. Like we have, we have a demo services service. Basically, acts as a default load balancer. 
and the root actually works on the service and provides the DNS. And we have provided the network using the network attachment definitions. Uh, you, you may be wondering how we're actually communicating. So the Ansible Automation Platform is actually running in one of our data centers. And this is actually running in the public cloud. And we have exposed two network interfaces. One that is the default pod network that allows us to do traditional Kubernetes routing. We've also exposed, uh, through a network attachment definition, more of a traditional route that we actually go ahead and allow for management traffic. So we use Ansible to be able to communicate over SSH. Remember how I mentioned earlier? Now, if you're familiar with OpenShift, you know that you cannot make use of SSH or non-HTTP-based routes through OpenShift Router. So we're using our management traffic ingress using one way. We have our traditional app um, traffic using a different network configuration, which is nice because you can actually separate traffic based upon functionality. This is the best part about this from a security standpoint. You can segment what traffic is talking where. So your public content cannot talk via the management layer, but your public content, like I want to show what my app has, can go talk through public, you know, through your DMZ or ways that you can get into your application. So it really showcases the flexibility and versatility that you now have by this architecture. You have more options. And, and you can just reuse what you already know or never used. So Harsha, can you go click on the, the job as it runs and let's see how it's going along. This is just Ansible. It's boring. It should be boring. You all have more important things to work on, right? Changing the business, reinventing things. We're not reinventing things. We're not, re, we're not making brand new fried chicken. We're just reinventing it in a new way. This task will create, this task will create the resources on OpenShift. And this is how you see, you can see uh, it's creating a namespace, a service route, and then finally virtual machines. And then once it's done, uh, it actually syncs the inventory that you can see here. Uh, yeah. Uh, open shift inventory. So you can see uh, all the hosts and the details inside. Once uh, it's using the uh, the OpenShift Dynamic Inventory plugin to get these details set. And finally... We, we, we didn't create these manually because it'd be impossible to create them because they have dynamic IP addresses. So that inventory is able to integrate the Kubernetes um, API for you to be able to understand what IP addresses are registered to those machines. And the inventory is populated automatically in Ansible Automation Platform. It'd be impossible to do this at scale without these tools. You have to go into every single machine or write up custom scripts. This is all available to you, provided by the collections available. And they're certified right now. You can go download them from Ansible Automation Hub uh, from console.redhat.com. Yeah. And this is basically deploying uh, EAP on the, those virtual machines as a cluster. And now we have the fun of, can we get this done in five minutes? While, it's, while our cake is finishing baking, do you have any questions? Because we're going to go right up to the wire. Any questions regarding any of the tools, any of the concepts that we've introduced thus far? Yes, Neil. So with, uh, with this uh, CubeVert-based virtualization thing, uh, do you still have access to things like graphical consoles and stuff for interactive virtual machines? So go back to that VM tab that you were there before, and you have a nice, wonderful, hey, look, it's a UI. And you can go in and log in. It's just like any other. And now you can run whatever you want. It's really cool. This is what blew my mind when I first saw it. I'm like, wait, what? Because I'm used to seeing pod logs in a pod terminal. That's a, that's a login screen on a prompt that I've probably used my entire career. It's bringing the best of both worlds, your traditional worlds and your modern worlds. And they're clashing, clashing in a good way. Trust me, they clash in many other bad ways, but we won't go there. That's for tonight at, at Fenway. We can talk about that. So what we're doing now is we're just finishing up. We're restarting EAP, ensuring that our last application is running. And if the technology gods allow us to finish quickly, we can actually show this running in OpenShift virtualization. Any other questions?
you're blown away, you're speechless, right? Actually, it'd be kind of cool to actually show the system D service on it. You can actually go into, you know, we're not, this is nothing, this is not magic here, folks. So if you go back over to the OpenShift tab and go into the virtual machine, it's right there. Oop. You just go back there and get a console again and just do a system CTL, yeah, whatever, or journal CTL dash F. No, it's like that. It, it do um, do system CTL list unit files list dash unit dash files dash list. No, no, no. List dash unit. No, nope. it's, it's all one word. It's the Wi-Fi conference. You know, it's not perfect. It's by all done. You believe us? Hey, it's done. Hey. We can go and try clicking our route. Hey, look, EAP. And go over to our little info app. And just confirm that. Oop. Slash info. Hey, look, an app worked. You can tell we're engineers. We don't look at fancy UIs here. But guess what? It, it makes the business money. It's just like the mainframe. Nobody looks at what the mainframe is going to be spitting out. It spits out money. That's what it does. Anyways, this showcases how we took our existing virtual machine infrastructure and app that are running on an OpenStack environment, and how easy it was to translate that into Kubernetes concepts using Ansible automation to make use and reuse your existing you know, state of automation to be able to ensure consistent environments no matter where they operate. Appreciate the time today. Thanks a lot. We'll be on to ask any questions.